Defining five criminal threats in Africa is complex. For the sake of this video, we have chosen to avoid any groups with overt religious or extremist connections and focus on more straightforward criminal outfits. Of all the regional looks we've done at organized crime around the world, the five groups featured here are the most diverse. In Nigeria, we look at the Black Axe, the most violent and numerous of that country's strange campus cults, student organizations gone rogue. In Madagascar, the cattle rustlers known as the Hollow have been steadily worsening their actions, now massacring and looting entire communities as the country's famine hits ever harder. And in the Central African Republic and Sudan, we look at the Wagner Group and how it has evolved from a paramilitary company to running a billion dollar illegal mining enterprise. For this video, World of Crime would like to thank the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, whose pioneering research and support have proved invaluable to our work. And now, I'm Chris Dorby, and welcome to World of Crime. Starting in the 1950s, a group of Nigerian students at the University of Ibadan formed the Pirates, an all-male fraternity aiming to give gifted students from poorer economic backgrounds a larger voice on campus. For two decades, until the end of the Nigerian Civil War in the 70s, the Pirates would remain almost the only such group in Nigeria. Its influence had spread abroad with graduates from the University of Ibadan, and it had grown to a considerable size. But that level of success brought dissent. Some members began accusing group leaders known as super pirates of violating their own rules, either by favoring members from specific ethnicities or of suspending those they didn't approve of. This triggered the creation of breakaway fraternities, which spread to other campuses and universities. By the 1980s, dozens of such groups existed across Nigeria, with thousands of members. Now, why did I just spend this time giving you a brief overview of Nigerian fraternities? Well, because elements within these groups soon used their power and influence to start lucrative criminal networks. In 1985, Nigeria suffered a coup d'etat, and successive military leaders found the fraternities very useful. They were encouraged to spy on student unions, which were hubs for political dissent, and then given weapons to attack student-led protests. Predictably, these weapons were then used by the fraternities against each other. At around the same time, a number of these groups began incorporating more religious practices, including voodoo, into their rituals. Their names became increasingly outlandish, including the Executioners, the Supreme Vikings, and the Klansmen, spelt with a K, and the Black Axe. From its origins in the late 1970s, the Black Axe was connected to the Neo-Black Movement of Africa, or NBM a pan-Africanist organization that claims to promote and advance African arts and culture around the world. But the Black Axe were connected to some of the worst excesses of Nigeria's campus wars of the 80s and 90s. According to a BBC investigation from 2020, that has not stopped. And now the Black Axe are routinely connected to massacres, murders, stabbings, and high connections to Nigeria's military. In the 2010s, they began to go global, and their practices became gradually clearer. A Harper's Magazine profile of the group described their initiation rituals, known as gyrations, as having prospective members be beaten, verbally abused, stamped on, and burned with a fire. Today, the relationship between the NBM and the Black Axe is muddled. For many, they are one and the same. But for members of the NBM, the Black Axe is a criminal offshoot far removed from its activities. What is certain is the Black Axe successes have followed it across Nigeria and around the world. The gang is particularly strong in the Nigerian cities of Lagos, Jos, and their spiritual home Benin City. Their main rivalry appears to be with another cult known as Aie, and dozens of murders and stabbings have been attributed to the feud since 2009. In 2022, the feud even spread to Dubai, where members of the Black Axe and the Aie were seen attacking each other with machetes. In Italy, the Black Axe has been hailed as a full-blown mafia, involved in cybercrime, drug trafficking, extortion and prostitution, 
The group has also been connected to rampant human trafficking and migrant smuggling between Nigeria and Sicily. In Ireland, the group has been connected to a scheme where young Nigerian nationals are recruited as money mules to help with money laundering. In August 2023, 34 people connected to the Black Axe were arrested in Ireland, and police estimated the group had laundered at least 64 million euros in the country. Even further afield, an Interpol operation in May 2023 seized Black Axe assets in 21 countries, with the group connected to cyber scams in Argentina, Brazil and Indonesia. This fits with a growing pattern of Nigerian cultists becoming increasingly involved in romance scams and other cyber crimes around the world perhaps feeling the pressure. In January 2024, the neo-black movement publicly renounced the Black Axe and denounced any association to the group. I assume you've heard of the Wagner Group, and I know what I said at the beginning of the video we're trying to avoid groups with political, military or religious leanings. But the actions of the Wagner Group in Mali, the Central African Republic and Sudan tip it from being a state-backed armed actor into the square criminal category. The Wagner Group, the largest of Russia's state-backed private military companies, first appeared in Africa in 2017, at the request of authorities in Sudan and Libya. In Sudan, they were largely deployed to train soldiers and protect gold, uranium and diamond mines, allegedly against incursions from South Sudan. In 2018, it started the same in the Central African Republic, deployed to officially protect mines. But even then, they were acting as extensions of the Kremlin and negotiating favorable mining deals for Russian interests. Over the following years, as Sudan fell into chaos following the overthrow of President Omar al-Bashir, the Wagner Group's authority became unclear. The comfort with which it operated in Sudan allowed it to use the country as an operating base to deploy to the Central African Republic, Libya and Chad. But over the years, the Wagner Group has begun operating essentially as an illegal mining force in Central and Northern Africa, as well as extorting communities where they operate. Some of these interests may have a veneer of legality, as a company owned by the now dead Wagner founder Yevgeny Prigozhin was granted formal mining concessions in Sudan in 2021. But other deals have been downright predatory. In the Central African Republic, connected to an associated group known as Lobai Invest, the Wagner Group has killed or driven off dozens of artisanal miners at gold and diamond mines. In Sudan, hundreds of people have allegedly been butchered by Wagner forces, including up to 70 in one single attack in a gold-rich region along the Sudan-Central African Republic border. And in early 2024, Wagner took over the Interhaka gold mine in Mali and may have eyes on expanding into lithium and uranium mining there. The scale of its mining interests in Africa now approaches $1 billion according to the Africa Defense Forum. Gold, diamonds, and other minerals are then smuggled to the United Arab Emirates, Russia, or other laundering hubs in order to avoid sanctions. This dominance has not diminished since the Wagner Group fell out of favor in Moscow and the killing of Prigozhin in August 2023. US sanctions against the group describe it specifically as a transnational organized crime group, not as a terrorist organization. And in February, a BBC investigation hinted that the Wagner Group was being rebranded under a new leader, Andrei Averyanov. Averyanov continues to focus on securing mineral wealth and recently toured half a dozen African countries, including Mali, Libya and Burkina Faso, with the purpose of expanding its business there. In countries with oppressive regimes, or where the rule of law is often absent, remote communities or specific ethnic groups can often be singled out for repeated criminal, political or religious persecution. In the face of this, these communities often have no other recourse than to arm up and create what have become known as self-defense groups. The Mexican groups known as Autodefensas are probably the best known example of this. In southwestern Mexico starting in around 2013, the Autodefensas de Michoacán grew from a few hundred people to thousands of members in two years and successfully drove out the Knights Templar cartel. But this did not contribute much to long-term stability. In the power vacuum that followed, leaders from the self-defense groups took over local criminal economies, including drug trafficking and extortion. In many cases, they've become as bad, if not worse, as the cartel they once kicked out. A similar process may be beginning to take shape 
among certain militias in Mali, Nigeria and Burkina Faso. In October 2014, Burkina Faso's president Blaise Compaore resigned after 27 years in power, after facing a massive uprising as he tried to push through plans to extend his rule even further. While many sections of Burkinabe society briefly came together to oust Compaore, the power vacuum he left behind was severe. Among the Mossi, Burkina Faso's largest ethnic group, villages began raising their own self-defense groups. These became known as Kogluyogo, a Mossi word meaning protectors. At first, they defended against low-level but persistent threats, such as the theft of vehicles or cattle. But after extremist Islamic groups entered Burkina Faso from Mali in 2018, the situation became more dire yet. A patchwork of age-old local and social rivalries between different communities and families of religious leaders known as Marabous began to surface. Following the Yirgu massacre in December 2018 and January 2019, in which jihadists murdered over 200 people, Kogluyogo militias launched reprisal raids, which killed dozens. This level of communal violence has led many Kogluyogo groups to engage in the type of banditry that they were created to fight against. Murder, theft, racketeering, kidnapping and cattle rustling have become standard, especially along the Volta River Basin in Burkina Faso. These groups have contributed to a massive glut of weapons entering the country, with arms trafficking rampant as vigilantes and extremist groups arm themselves, while citizens also seek protection from both sides. These militias have often taken over control of infrastructure, such as gold mining, often in collusion with political elites and local strongmen who take a share of the profits. The Burkina Faso government has tried to rein in the problem and has invited militia groups to join the armed forces in a new force known as the VDP. But this is a difficult knot to unravel. Among the Mossi communities that spawned them, Kogluyogo militias are often seen as efficient and necessary. They are typically brutal in their application of their version of the law, even if there have been plentiful allegations of extrajudicial killings and punishments being meted out without trial. Both the Kogloyogo and the VDP have been accused of singling out communities from the rival Fulani ethnic group for persecution and violence. Ultimately, the Kogloyogo are a highly diverse and fluid network of groups. Some may act violently and with criminal intent, while others may not. But in a future Burkina Faso, where the current conflict dynamics have faded, this large pool of armed individuals may represent a serious long-term threat to national security. In 2023, Cape Town was listed as the 10th most dangerous city in the world with over 4,200 murders. It was the only African city and the only city outside the Americas to feature on the list. This can seem at odds with Cape Town and the surrounding Western Cape's reputation as one of South Africa's more tourist-friendly and wealthy areas. The problem lies in that a generations-old campaign of gang warfare in Cape Town has been getting steadily worse for years. The racial segregation of apartheid saw gangs flourish in the Cape Flats, a sprawling and impoverished section of the city stretching out to the southeast. In the 80s and 90s, the Cape Flats gang scene was taken over by a group known as the Americans, who quickly consolidated themselves as a dominant force. The Americans and other gangs made their money, as did their rivals, mostly from drug trafficking, selling heroin, crystal meth, crack cocaine and later Woonga, a highly addictive heroin variant mixed with other substances. The Americans, while always fighting numerous rivals, became known for being almost a corporate entity, empowering smaller offshoots to act in their name. From 2010, the Americans began to lose their grip and fragmentation accelerated. An influx of firearms into the city gave smaller groups the chance to go into business for themselves. As seen in Mexico, Colombia and Nigeria, criminal fragmentation leads to smaller gangs fighting more viciously to defend their criminal turf. And the same has happened in Cape Town. Since 2022, the gang to watch out for in the city has been the Fancy Boys. According to research by the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, the Fancy Boys have led an aggressive campaign against the Americans and the Hard Livings Gang to be the gang that controls everything. So successful have they been that rival members are now joining up with the Fancy Boys. 
While the Cape Town gang scene has been highly divided, the fancy boys are able to outmuscle, outgun, and outspend their rivals. Drugs and weapons are distributed more freely, making it enticing for new recruits to join up. In 2023, the spiral of violence continued worse than ever, and a corrupt state and complicit police seem unlikely to make any meaningful long-term difference, apart from occasional raids into slums on the Cape Flats. Madagascar's Dahalo are difficult to pin down. Going back several decades, they were first described as marginalized people in the south of the country who lived outside villages with no property of their own. A UN investigation stated that their forays into cattle rustling would be to steal a few zipu, a type of humped cattle popular in Madagascar, to use as a bride price when they wanted to get married. In the 1970s, bands of Dahalo grew more organized and better armed, with their numbers growing into the hundreds. They would then descend into cattle farming communities, steal all livestock, but also carry out kidnappings and burglaries, as well as killing any who resisted. Their bases in a very remote, mountainous part of Madagascar, only accessible by foot, made it very difficult for authorities to mount any sort of resistance. As a side note, cattle rustling is often ignored next to more violent crimes in Africa, but it is an absolutely devastating practice in rural, agriculture-based economies. In Nigeria and Mali, among other African countries, a spread in cattle rustling has been closely linked to increasing instability. In fact, the situation in Madagascar worsened in the 2000s, as poverty, drought and famine continued to strike. Cattle rustling was seen as such a problem that the new military regime responded far more brutally to Dahalo threats. The security forces were accused of human rights abuses of their own, such as burning down entire communities suspected of having connections to the Dahalo. Villagers also hired private security who killed cattle raiders. An anti dahalo police unit was created in 2016, but it's been criticized as being underfunded and understaffed and has not really made a difference. The full scale of what has become known as the Zebu War has been hard to determine, as it takes place in the remotest parts of Madagascar, where monitoring and on-the-ground reporting are next to impossible. The large-scale famine which has gripped Madagascar, particularly since 2021, has only made it worse. And Dahalo gangs have expanded to other forms of brutality. In July 2022, the government blamed the Dahalo for killing at least 32 people north of the capital Antananarivo, including burning some alive in their homes. With Madagascar consistently among the poorest countries on the planet, with worsening environmental degradation and with little expected improvement, the Dahalo threat may only continue to grow. And that's it. That completes our tour of five criminal threats in Africa you need to know about. We're very excited for everything that's coming up on YouTube, so please subscribe as we continue to bring you untold criminal stories from around the world. Until next time, this was World of Crime.